hearing uh, to order at six o'clock for the proposed budget for fiscal year 25. And Shelly's gonna take over. Take here. it away. That's the end of my vote. <laughs> I'm just gonna say. Last night, there is a student report, but we have to do a public hearing first. It's going to be about 20 to 30 minutes, okay? So you're welcome to take the camera off and show for a little bit, but we have to do this point of order first, okay? All right. Oh, yeah. Chris, do you need a minute? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so everyone can see the presentation. Frontiers uh, FY25 budget for public hearing. Uh, this document was not sent out yet. I will send this out to school committee and town administrators after the meeting. This is basically a summary of the larger document that was already shared. I broke it down because it was a pretty lengthy narrative that I sent you. Hopefully, select board and finance committee members received that through your town administrators. Um, if not, we can forward it off and I'm happy to send it to anyone that needs it. Uh, so we're going to start by talking about the budget development process. I am going to go pretty quickly because it is lengthy and I, I don't want to hold us here too long, but um, we'll have plenty of place for questions. So in the budget development process, we seek input from key stakeholders, including administrative staff, uh, department heads, um, facilities, IT, principal, curriculum, essentially anyone who's in an administrative position uh, helping to operate the school. And our goal in budget development is to develop a needs-based, student-centered budget while being fiscally responsible and taking a hybrid approach to balancing level services, looking at supplemental funds, and then also addressing new needs and initiatives. Uh, it's a pretty comprehensive process. It starts in November and December with the administration looking at the level service budget, which replicates services, programming, and staffing from the prior year. January, the first draft goes to the budget subcommittee for review. Uh, the subcommittee this year actually met again in early February and moved forward with a budget to present to full school committee at the February meeting. And then here we are in March, uh, we have public hearing tonight, and then a vote on Thursday night, and then we'll continue through the final approval process uh, with town meetings through April, um, or I'm sorry, through June. A uh, couple of things I want to note in the budget process is level service does not translate to level funding. That's really important that the public hears. There's always increased costs for staffing alone based on contractual obligations or non-contractual obligations for our non-union employees. Um, we're also experienced, as I think all of our towns are and all of us personally are feeling, um, the effects of inflation following COVID, uh, cost of supplies and materials is significantly higher than it has been in previous years. So while we talk about level service as the starting point, there is always a natural increase. Um, we work hard to balance that natural increase while also looking at our new needs. So we're gonna move on and start with uh, level services and what those numbers look like. So what is the level service increase uh, for fiscal year 25? So we are looking at level service came in at 2.62% or roughly 330,000. You can see the composition of the increase there is split between wages and non-wages. Uh, contractual increases for union employees represented a 2% COLA plus a step, which varies depending on the teacher or the IA contract, but it's That number can be higher if you have someone who advanced their education 
position and has a higher degree and they're seeing column movement within the contract. So some employees will actually receive, instead of a two plus four, it might be two plus five or six, depending on how far advanced um, they went with their degree. So that's important to take into consideration here because it's not level across the board for all staff and it does have a big impact. <coughs> Um, Non-union employee wages include any other staff in the building, uh, secretaries, cafeteria, custodial, administrative staff that are on individual contracts. If I left anyone out, I do apologize. It's <laughs> just an oversight on my part. Um, and then we also look to capture savings due to retirements or attrition. So if we know we have someone retiring and they were a veteran teacher, they've been here for 20, 25 years, uh, we expect to hire at a lower step within the contract, so we take that into consideration as well. Uh, I believe for Frontier that is about a $70,000 savings this year, or this level services would be that much higher, closer to $40,000. Non-wage increases impacting the budget uh, year to year are always our non-employee insurance, so our liability insurance, particularly our student accident insurance. Some of those are based on claims, some of it's just based on the market. Um, health insurance is a significant factor. The district has not seen a significant increase in health insurance rate in some years. In fact, um, prior to last year, for five years, there was no increase with the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust. Last year, there was a 6% increase. This year, we're seeing an 8% increase. So that has been reflected in the budget as well. Retirement contributions. Uh, those are twofold. Uh, what we contribute to Franklin Regional Retirement for anyone who is not on the teacher contract, we are assessed annually. That contribution has gone up this year, as well as our um, employee separation costs we take into consideration there. So based on the teacher contract, there is a sick buyback when teachers retire. This year that worked out in Frontier's benefit. Um, we have a savings in that line item, so that's reflected in the budget as well. Transportation and building grounds and maintenance are also significant drivers in our non-wage increase. Uh, transportation, I know that the, the bid and the contract uh, info was sent out to school committee. I think that's trickled out to town administrators as well. It is an agenda item later on on the agenda, I believe, for executive discussion, our session for further discussion on that. But what I will say in this regard is Frontier is not seeing the same level of impact to the budget as the elementary schools because of the way that the prior contract was structured and some changes that we had within the contract in the last five years. For example, um, the, the budget is built for 12 buses. The last few years, we've only been using 11 buses based on ridership. So there already was a buffer built in and then we added a 10% increase. So Frontier is not bearing the brunt of the significant transportation cost increase year, although there is 40,000 additional built in. Um, building grounds and maintenance, we have not increased these line items in at least the five years that I have been with the district and we spend over repeatedly. Uh, budget subcommittee and administration and eventually school committee felt like it was time to add in some additional funds. Our regular, uh, our, our typical budget for buildings and grounds maintenance is about 70 to 75,000. We're increasing that to 100,000 in the new year. And again, that's primarily related to supplies and materials and costs of contracted services. Any types of repairs that we're doing are significantly higher than they were, um, particularly in the last few years since COVID. All right. Do you want to take questions? Sure. We can take questions. Uh, Linda, you have your hand up. Linda, do you have a question? If the hand went up and down, somebody guess. No, if you have one later. Feel free to put your hand up. So we're going to talk about new requests and initiatives next. And uh, what was requested this year is explained here on the slide. Uh, what was approved is an additional 0.52% or $65,000. So we talked about new requests of $115,000, which uh, was made up of a full, transitioning the athletic director position to full time and uh, changing the role slightly back to where it was a AD slash PE teacher a few years back. 
Uh, so we're looking to increase about 50,000 for that. We have uh, outside consultant services for professional development for new teachers, and then we have teacher stipends. Both of those items have been paid from ESSER funds for the prior three years. Those funds will no longer be available. It's about $15,000 for that additional increase. The last item that was discussed was the addition of a full-time athletic trainer, which would be a contracted position, not a staffing position. Um, this position uh, had a significant level of conversation and debate at the last school committee meeting. It was agreed that there is a desire to add this position, whether it's contracted or staff member to the budget. However, we felt like we needed more information and we did not want to increase the budget by another $50,000. So we agreed that the administration would go back and uh, get an updated contract for one, and to see if there would be another funding source to fund this, if not next year, in the future. So that'll be up for future conversation. Uh, but what was approved by school committee at the February meeting is the full-time AD slash AE teacher, and then 15,000 for teacher professional development and teacher status. Yeah. Will, will you be coming back to these for discussion, or should we be asking you questions as you go through the slides? I find the questions now. Okay, so if we uh, zero in on the full-time athletic director, um, as I see in, on the uh, spreadsheet, um, now that has gone from 11,000 to now 70, so you're adding 65 to, an 11, to a part-time $11,000 position. Um, yes, or so about? So let me explain the position and then we can talk about the numbers because the position has evolved over the last couple years. Previously, this position was a stipend in the teacher contract. So we had a PE teacher acting as the AD receiving about $11,000. Last year, okay. yep, there, go ahead. With the very limited, they were teaching one block out of, out of the day when there's four blocks there, teaching blocks there, teachers teachers do. So not only were they doing the position, it wasn't just they were a teacher with a stipend, the majority of their day was blocked off for athletic directing and they taught one class one block a day, so multiple classes because it's PE every other day, multiple semester. Okay, just want to make sure because it's, it sounds like it's not, like if they're working a full-time job and they just doing a second on the end, it was part of the compensation. Except of like that work. they were expected to be here yep, regular true. hours, so normal teacher work day, and then covering whatever they needed to for athletic okay. events on top of it. Okay. So last year, after the budget was approved, unfortunately, a change happened with the position and uh, the teacher that was in that role resigned from the AD position, but may, was maintained as a PE. Please correct me if I'm wrong to jump in. Maintained as a PE teacher, and Good. this year has returned to teaching more PE classes and only teaching PE. So administration and school committee had to make a decision about how to move forward with the AD position. We need an athletic director. Sports are prominent here. You sure. know that yourself. Sure. Um, no. So, the position changed to part-time out of the contract. So in the current year, we are paying $25,000. So we're finding funds that were not budgeted last year to cover the difference. And he that has experience with bring them inside. Well, so it'll get posted, and if someone internally wants to apply, they're certainly welcome to. Um, I think the tricky part with this that we're gonna have to navigate is in order to teach BE, you have to have teacher qualifications sure. as well. So, you know, George will be seeking unique candidates that can fulfill both those roles. But the idea behind this position, and again, please interrupt <coughs> George if I'm not translating properly. The idea behind this is that they will teach an afternoon class so that they can have flexibility in the schedule to flex and be here more at night when they need to so that we're not burning out whoever this person is in the role. Because it, the, the athletic director position is significant. I think MIA says that it has, do they have to show up to all games? Um, well, you, have have, you have to have a game administrator. You have to have a game you can, administrator. You can be an assigned person in a tournament game, you have to have an actual school administrator. Okay. Um, okay. So going back to the numbers, yeah. when you look at the line by line budget, mm -hmm. you are 100% correct. It does show that we are jumping from 11 to 75 because right. of all of those changes that have taken place in the last few years. Okay. And 
if you look at that full-time athletic trainer, now, um, I mean, personally, I would be supportive of that, uh, but who will manage that person? And have you, has there, has, I mean, it almost falls to within the um, medical nursing realm um, in some respects, and um, the athletic trainer, has there been any thought to go outside and um, contract? So we are looking at a contracted service with um, Cooley Dickinson slash Mass Brigham Women's. They have these services available. They did provide us a quote a few years back. Um, it would be a full-time position. The uh, trainer would be at all wrestling and all football events as required. Um, and then that's required by NIAA. And then on-site available to assess injuries, whether it's you know, during a game or post-injury repair, that kind of thing, work with students, maintain inventory, um, you know, just kind of work with coaches, who they would report to. There is some structure in the contract about who they report to at the hospital that they fall under, but then here it would be, you know, ultimately between George, the AD, Scott Dredge, and any nursing staff that need to be involved. And as it's a contract position, we would be paying on So we understand the need for this. It's just a matter of finding something. MIAA has required this. Who now fills that role? We contract out primarily with local EMT or other athletic trainers if we can. But it's only at the required events currently, only at football and only at wrestling. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily the same person. Not necessarily the same person. Right, no, it's yeah. definitely, we can even use EMT to use the yeah. All right, we have questions from the Sutherland Select Board. Can we all there? Yeah, Okay. You can hear us fine right now when I'm talking, right, Jeff? It's when people from the side are. Yes. Just we'll repeat, we'll repeat questions and such. Thanks. You're right. News coming out. Sound coming out. Yeah. Any other questions on the new request before I keep going? So let's talk about the total cost. So we talked about a level service increase and new requests of 65,000. So that puts our total general fund for FY25 at 3.14% increase over the prior year. That's what we are presenting tonight in public hearing. Uh, I also wanted to make a note that we do use additional funds to fully uh, pay for the district's budget. There are grants of almost 400,000 and roughly 1.4 million in revolving funds that we use as well. So moving forward, when we talk about funding sources, we are talking about a total budget of $14,772,071. Okay, all right. All right, what's next? We're gonna talk about expenses next. I'm not gonna read through this. Um, this was in the major uh, narrative handout, but this is the chart of account narrative that Desi sends us as what the categorized expenses are. Um, they're really five or six primary categories, district administration, instruction, pupil services, plant operations, benefits and fixed charges, and then programs related to other school districts. So that's our out-of-district placement costs. And how are Frontier's expenses distributed? So just a few quick facts in here. 47% uh, of the budget are directly related to instruction slash teaching and learning. So that is anyone uh, that's working directly with students. So teachers, um, IAs, administrative staff in the main office, not central office staff. So anyone who's directly involved in educating students. 
Uh, expenses related to employee and retiree benefits make up about 2.5 million. Pupil services, which is primarily transportation, but also includes um, the medical office, so the nurse's office, uh, athletics, and food service, that's about 1.6 million of the budget. Physical plant and operations, so building and grounds is about 1.3 million. And I also want to note that about 55% of the budget goes to wages, uh, majority of that going directly to staff who work with students. So a couple of charts here, these were all in the larger um, packet that I sent out just to give you a visualization. So that's where you see uh, almost half of the ex overall expenses are going to instruction. Salaries and wages, you can see where that larger number comes into play. And then overall, it starts to iron itself out a little bit with benefits and fixed charges um, being the most significant. All right, so we're gonna move on to how the budget is funded. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Chapter 70. Anyone who's been around the block a few times knows that Chapter 70 is a very complicated formula, so I'm really gonna get minimalistic with <coughs> this. Um, if you have questions, please stop me. Um, but this is directly from Desi's website. The Chapter 70 program is the major program of state aid to public elementary and secondary schools. In addition to providing state aid to support school operations, it also establishes minimum spending requirements for each school district and minimum requirements for each municipality's share of school costs. So that last statement there, each municipality's share of school costs, is what is also known as the required town contribution and has a significant impact on the assessment, which we're gonna to continue to talk about as we go through. And then the state aid is what Frontier actually receives from the state for um, revenue to help support the budget. Continuing talking about Chapter 70. So our state aid, Frontier State Aid in FY25, it numbers up there almost two point, or I'm sorry, almost three million stated there. Uh, you can see in that third bullet down, it is only a $14,340 increase F over FY24. And that is because Frontier is in what is called hold harmless state. And with hold harmless, it means that your enrollment is either declining or stagnant from the prior year. So because our enrollment has sort of leveled off or decreased, we are only seeing a minimum um, per pupil increase of $30 per student. That translates to the 14340 As it stands right now, this is based on the governor's budget. The last two school years, that number has increased uh, through the, how the state budget process to $60 per pupil. If that's the case, we'll receive an additional roughly $15,000. At this number, it funds about 23% of the district's general fund expenditures. Uh, so it leaves a pretty significant gap for us to find other funding sources. Uh, which primarily comes from our towns. You're going to see that repeat theme as we continue to go through the process. And I just also want to add in as you listen to the news and stuff about the Student Opportunity Act, the Student Opportunity Act is Chapter 7. So they, they just kind of recalled it something else, they're putting more money into it. The majority of those funds are going to, um, are going to more um, urban districts, you know, where the most students are, but really there's a large number of schools like ours or I think it's 160 that are getting minimum amount of money out of the 300 and so towns in the, in the state. So just kind of putting it out there, we're in the same boat as everybody else. They're doing a lot of talk at the state level about whether they're going to correct that, but this is where we are right now. And I think it's a hand up question from Sunderland. Yeah, you're saying this year is 23% of the general fund expenditures. Do you know what it's been uh, the last couple of years? Is that a decrease? No, it's it's roughly the same. We have received that minimum per pupil increase for quite some time. Um, so it, it's not going to fund any more than that, and it's not going to ever be any less. It's written into the law that a district must receive at least what they got the prior year plus the $30 per pupil unless they change the legislation, as I said, and they increased that to 60 the last two years. And Jeff, just to let you know, I had to mute you because you got, your system is giving feedback to our system after you ask your question, you have to mute, okay? 
because you're you guys are broadcasting our sound on your system. There is talk out there. Sorry. Good. Okay. There's a lot of talk in the news uh, about how some districts are seeing a decrease in their Chapter 70. That is in relation to the Student Opportunity Act, like Darius was just explaining. While some districts have received more money in the past, the way that the formula is written, it takes into consideration an inflation factor. Inflation is down from 24 to 25, according to the state's formula. So districts that received hundreds or some even millions of dollars more in aid in 24 are seeing a decrease. We're not gonna have that um, happen because we're, we're guaranteed to get at least what we received before plus the per people increase. However, it's only $14,000, so um, it's really not helping in the grand scheme of things. The, we, don't have the the problem, we don't have the problem receiving less people. this year because we received too much last year. Yes. We're not too much of a larger sum. Yeah. Um, so the second part of the Chapter 70 that I touched on in the last slide is the town required contribution. So this is the amount that the state says our towns, our member towns, can afford to pay for public education of residents that attend Frontier Regional School District. So this is based on a few things. Again, a very complicated formula, um, but primary factors are enrollment, and you can see the change in enrollment on the slides there in where it says 24 and 25. Um, those are the enrollment numbers. So you can see we're decreasing by 10 students, 10 resident students from 488 to 478. And then the next two columns show you the dollar amount that the state said each of our towns could pay in 24 and 25. I know that is small on the screen. The bottom line is the state says that our four member towns can afford to pay $111,944 more than they did in the prior year. Conway is seeing an increase of 38,000. Deerfield, according to the state, will pay 12,000 less. Sunderland will pay 18,000 more. And Waitley, according to the state's formula, can afford $67,000 more. So Waitley is carrying the brunt of that increase uh, for required town contribution. This year, yeah. yes. <laughs> it was our turn. Yeah. Any questions on this before I keep going? Yeah, I have a question. So school of choice, how does that factor into hold harmless? School of choice not? does not factor into hold harmless. Chapter 70 is strictly related to resident Resident's. students. So what's the enrollment this year in terms of the 488 students? And what additional number of students are school of choice? Uh, and what I are you have projecting an enrollment for slide that I can pull up. I believe we're going to be, let me get to my So the question was, um, what is the school choice enrollment number compared to, do you have it? All I'll say, I like this presentation this year. It's a lot more fun. Thank you. So this is going to be hard to see because it's small. We'll just read it all. Um, so this is a five-year from, whoops, see, where did I go? <laughs> we, can, we can move on. <laughs> it's OK. I think it's an important question. I think people are curious. No, just follow on to be helpful if the chapter 71, if, if it's possible to send us like a 10-year History, because I like to take that and then look at inflation. Yeah. Because they talk about CPI inflation, I'm assuming, but we don't live in the world of CPI inflation. We have COLA step ups. I mean, yeah. it's uh, kind of apples and donuts. So this might be hard to see here, um, but this gives you a, I think I did five, seven years, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years. Uh, you can see the, the orange is total enrollment. We've gone since 2019 fiscal year, 647 students, of which 172 were school choice, to 615 is what we're projecting next year, with 167 being school choice. So our resident enrollment is actually dropping. Our school choice enrollment is staying relatively steady, probably on average about 175 students a year over the last seven years. Thank you. Someone has their hand up again? Again. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Um, 
Back on the, the last slide, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Um, just just for people who may be watching, uh, Sunderland enrollment went down, and our state, uh, the town required contribution went up. Is that because the assessed properties in town went up, or I, I know you didn't want to get into too much detail about the formula, but no, that's a really great question, Jeff. You're you're right on target there. So I said that there are a couple components of the formula, um, which I am going to touch on exactly what you just said. So enrollment is one of them, as is town property values and actual resident income. So the people that live in your towns how much money they make impacts what the state says that you can afford to pay for education based on the formula. Does that answer your question, Jeff? So while your enrollment is down, your property values are, are likely higher, especially given the market right now. Um, and as you know, we can assume that your residents are making more money as well. And we've talked about this, that because of the size of our towns, you could have a millionaire or two move into town and throw off this whole thing, and you actually didn't make more money other than hopefully they bought a very nice house. But outside of that, they can throw off the whole the whole thing. And that happened, I remember happening in Conway a few years back where you had to move in and you had some money coming in from the, the, the dam or something of that sort. And you know you were up 100, well over $100,000. So, and I think some of them when they built those apartments, right? Yeah, I don't know if yeah. that's happened when someone had the yeah. apartments, those kind of things. So yeah, so that's the, we don't have any control or, or understand how that number is. It's just sent through us on the, but if, and if I could just address that, this is one. There's something really cruel about capping towns and raising taxes two and a half percent, but having the formula based on what they could pay, but you can't actually. <laughs> that. so, and a little public off there. Uh, that's Jeff, this is um, Philip, your colleague on the Conway Select Board. Tip. If there's one thing that we could that when when we advocate with our legislative um, uh, people that that if there's one thing that would be the most effective for our towns is for them to make changes in this formula that, that they use to det determine the minimum contribution the especially the part about the income they know that it's it, it's deeply unfair to the towns. To, to, to towns with smaller populations. With towns with larger populations, it smooths out. But it is very often the case in, in our four towns that it's just one or two financially blessed families that come into your town in the year, in the past year, that skews your whole town's additional, you know, that, that, that makes your whole town liable for additional payments. And Massachusetts is one of these only bizarre world states where you actually get penalized for wealthier people moving into your town and everybody else has to subsidize that to this extent. And, and they, could, they could alter this formula um, and there's always talk about it, but this is the one thing that you should, that, that uh, you know, I try to get people to talk to their legislators about. They can make a change in this. Yeah, so I, I think to just kind of put it a little more concisely, if you are concerned about how money goes to especially rural districts, how all this money gets funded, I would encourage anybody who's watching or listening or getting this information one way or the other to reach out to your local representatives and share, share those concerns because we are not unique in terms of rural districts or who face these financial challenges and it ends up not just falling on the school committees shoulders but all of yours as well okay anyone else before we keep going all right let's move on uh, so let's talk about other funding sources next I'm going to quickly move through these but again we'll give opportunity for questions so these are the additional funding sources so if the chapter 70 only covers 23 percent we need to make up that difference elsewhere and this is what we're projecting for uh, next school year. So state transportation reimbursement only applies to a regional school district. It is reimbursement from the state for resident students who we transport who reside at least one and a half miles from the school. So there is again a formula that's taken into consideration. Um, I know that the governor is committed to or has been committed to increasing the number, although we are seeing a decline here over FY24 because of the state's budget status. 
Um, I believe we're down about 40,000 as written on the cherry sheet stands right now. Um, years and years and years ago, when the state put regional transportation in, into play, it was to um, incentivize small districts like ours to regionalize and provide support for that transportation. They uh, guaranteed funding at 100% and it's never been funded at 100%. I believe last year it was 90. Uh, and the way the governor's budget written right now is about 80%. And again, that's only reimbursement on um, residents we transport over uh, 1.5 miles from the school. Excess and deficiency is another revenue source for the district. So like our towns, uh, Frontier operates in mu much of the same fashion when it comes to E&D. We are allowed to carry excess, excess free cash up to 5% of the budget um, into the new year for whatever expenditures we, we see fit as school committee approves. So that could be capital projects, um, use of funds towards the budget, uh, and holding for emergencies. We do have to go through an approval process with our towns when we want to use those funds, so we make sure we're following what's required by law there. Uh, and historically, over the last at least five years, if not longer, the school committee has committed $200,000 of excess and deficiency towards the next year's budget. That will be maintained in FY25. Uh, and here's where the big number comes into play again. Uh, the balance of our budget outside of what's funded by special revenues, because these three pieces on the left pertain only to the general fund, not any of our revolving funds and grants, which supplements our budget. So the additional almost four million will be funded through the member town assessment. So the state says that our towns can afford to pay, um, it was 5.6 million, I think, on the last slide. Yes, 5614005, and in order for us to actually fully operate our budget or our school and meet the district requirements of almost 13 million, we will assess the towns an additional four million dollars, roughly, uh, and that's based on a cost-sharing agreement as written in the regional agreement developed. I can't remember what year, but long time ago um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the assessment coming up so if you do have questions about the assessment if you can hold those until we continue going through that would be great uh, so then the last piece of this slide on the um, far right there explains our special special revenues uh, I talked about that a little bit earlier that's where we come up with the 14.7 million versus the general fund budget of I think it was like 12.5 um, we use an additional 1.7 million of revolving funds and grants. That could include school choice revenues. Uh, we have a thriving special education program here where we bring in students from other districts and receive tuition funds for that. that that's included here. Um, school lunch revenues. Uh, what else is in there? Athletics revolving, if it supplements. Um, grants may include state and or federal grants. Some are special education related, some not. So um, it's a pretty significant number. It's about usually on average year to year an additional 10 to 13% of supplemental funds that is not funded through the general fund. So um, we are doing what we can to keep the general fund number down as much as we can. Any questions on revenues outside of the assessment? I think the next slide is just a pie chart showing you here what the funding really looks like. So the chapter 70 aid is in the blue, that is in the upper um, portion of the pie chart. The member town state required contribution is the larger green chunk, and then the additional member town assessment is the orange. So you can see our four towns are funding roughly three quarters of our budget, and then the other smaller funding sources, excess and deficiency, state transportation, and then grants and revolving funds. Quick historical information, I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but generally uh, in a five year span, Frontier's budget has grown 13.29% or $1.5 million, which translates to an average of 2.65 a year, or just over 300,000 a year. Question from Sunderland. Yeah, the Moreland statement that um, in that same time frame, Sunderland's assessment has gone up 554,000 and increased about 30%. So 
Well, we appreciate everything you do to keep the overall number down. Um, if you want to point out that Sunderland has seen uh, dramatically higher increases than the other now. Which historically goes back to the state's formula, not because of the budget um, cost share percentage, but you guys did have a big swing over multiple fiscal years of what the state said that you could afford, which increased your assessment pretty significantly. All right. I believe we're getting into assessment. All right, let's talk about it, because here's what everybody wants to know, what the numbers look like. So according to the regional agreement, the cost of construction and operation are shared between member towns according to a five-year enrollment average. So the formula is the state required contribution plus the additional to fund the budget plus any capital assessment and any debt service assessment equals the total assessment to our towns annually. Cost sharing formula for next year is here. Uh, you can see the five-year rolling enrollment is based on 2,296 students. The breakdown there is, is by town. Uh, Conway's share for FY25 is 16.46%. Deerfield, 48.69%. Sunderland, 23.43%. And Waitley, 11.41%. snapshot of the general fund assessment so you can see the total state required contribution of 5.6 million the additional assessment of 3.9 so our total general fund assessment is uh, just above 9.5 million comparatively to last year which was 9.2 so the overall assessment is 3.69 percent for the general fund capital and debt uh, school committee is proposing a $100,000 assessment for fire panel replacement project and a debt service assessment for the ban interest that comes due in July for projects that have already been completed and voted on years ago. Uh, that debt coming due in July is just over $40,000. So the total capital and debt assessment is $140,230 which is $17,045 over the prior year. <coughs> and then I've given you the total assessment numbers here. So when you add up those three components, you can see in the far column FY24 to FY25 change. Conway is seeing a 5.25% increase, Deerfield 1.89, Sunderland 4.20, Waitley 9.51, and overall, Frontier's budget assessment is growing by 3.83% with all components factored. And that is all I have to say. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer questions. We can go back to things if you have assessment questions. You know, I did send out the full doc. I have some copies here if anyone wants paper copies, and I can send out the truncated slideshow as well. I have a question regarding the expenditure side. What expenditure at this point are we speculating? In other words, we obviously know the salary increases and steps, but what expenditures, I call it a material amount of $50,000 or more based on our budget size, are, are yet not known. Health insurance is pretty well figured in, right? Everything should be known at this point. The last scary and surprising factor came last week with the transportation bid. Um, and that's been accounted for in here. I don't anticipate, short of an emergency, I don't anticipate any significant changes in our numbers. Um, I wrote down a whole bunch of notes. Apologize in advance. So first, thank you very much for the very informative presentation. You guys are always very disciplined about um, how you go about the budgeting. It's totally appreciated. Um, I want to give you a little feel for where Deerfield is totally <coughs> financially right now. Um, the, the schools, and you know this <coughs> anyway, so the schools are like 65 plus percent of our total budget. Prop two and a half limits our increase to two and a half percent plus new growth. New growth is not horrendously significant. So when the school goes up 3.8%, that's really hard on 
the rest of the things that we fund in town. Um, so it, it, it's challenging to do that. And when you look at these, everybody's like, why are you whining? Because you've only got 1.8% here. But um, the kids who, a whole bunch of kids are going to Franklin Tech. So we had a 10 kid increase in Franklin Tech. Our Franklin Tech bill went up 40%. Um, so our overall school bill did not, it, it's not just a 1.7% because when you wrap Franklin Tech in, that's, it, it's, I, I think it's probably more per kid incrementally to go to Franklin Tech than it is to come to Frontier. So, um, so we are, you know, I, I am whining, and it's not because of the tier, but, but it's because they're just so the tax closure, 27,000 per student here, 13. Yeah, exactly. So um, we are in Deerfield. We're kind of up against the prop two and a half limit, um, and we're trying, desperately trying not to do an override this year, but um, we are, when we put all of the budget together right now, it looks like we're about, 150,000 in the hole, and that's with the, the only capital that's in that budget is your capital request. Um, so we're not buying anything for the highway department, no capital at all, and we're going through and trying to cut the budgets. Um, our town accountant went through and has been working with all the different categories. She was able to find about 110,000 that she was cut out, and then the um, transportation bill came in and just like came that up. Right. So we're, we're really kind of hurting in Deerfield this year. Um, the only, and I hate it when people say wine and say like, this is all bad and they don't offer any suggestions. I have no suggestions <laughs> really, but it, it, if you all can find anywhere that you have um, reserves or anything that you can apply to this. The one idea I did have doesn't help the Deerfield taxpayer much, but it helps us with that prop two and a half limit. Um, when you go back to your capital projects, um, I think you've paid off some of the debt excluded with reserves, and I was wondering if you could pay for that fire alarm panel with the reserves and charge us the 100000 under debt excluded instead of not debt excluded. That would help us with our Prop 2 and a half problem um, without decreasing the money that you all are receiving. So, um, does that make sense? I don't feel like that. I don't know if everyone understands, and maybe you do, but I had to look some things up to make sure I knew what the town would be trying to go for. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit more because if school committee is going to um, deliberate that. I mean, we did receive the court request to yeah. consider this from the town here, but so we bring that up. It's appropriate time to bring it up now. So go ahead and just take yeah, it. so I guess the question I have is why don't you restate it so that okay. it's also so that the, the, owl. the owl can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with debt exclusion, it's a one time tax increase, right? It's not prop two and a half where right. it's long term. But you still need a ballot vote and but we already voted it. Like several years ago we voted to debt exclude the that whole chunk of money, okay. that oh, 40000 or something of that is, is That's still the in interest. But yeah. you said, yeah, but you said you were paying off the we debt are. Yes. using your funds. Can yes. you pay off everything except for $100,000? So you won't debt? have to do another Right, ballot. it's already debt excluded. It's already been voted. That was the part that Darius and I weren't 100% sure. So there's no risk to Frontier of it not getting approved at the town and not exactly to right. it's already been approved. So that will come in when we discuss about it later. Yeah. But yeah. So but we're going to circle if, if school members have questions for, so we're this the, the, the public hearing part of this, we're having dialogue with the public, and which is essentially our, our finance committees and select boards. But um, so if school members have questions regarding that, we'll, we'll have a discussion afterwards if we're gonna alter the budget in that way, but it's a good time for a dialogue if people have questions about, um, so we use the brain power in the room if we do. I guess, Shelly, was that your concern, is that if we did that, that we'd be at risk of waiting for a ballot to approve that? Right. that yeah, okay. So yeah, that, uh, that's, it's, if, 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 if the school can help the towns and it doesn't affect 
the budget in any way, it makes sense to help the towns. But well, I, it would still be the assessment. It's just a matter of how the town pays for it. Right? Correct. Right. But, but I would ask that the school run this by the school attorney and make sure that the school attorney agrees and that the votes are of record and et cetera, et cetera. And that it would not. Be so the school committee does that later in the meeting. Uh, we have, we're not voting the budget tonight. So right. I can follow up with council on all that stuff. <coughs> what else, Julia? No, I'm not spending X amount of money in a certain place, but how is that going to impact the student? And where is that going to lead um, for those students, both within the school and after they graduate? So at the end of it all, yes, $27,000 a year per student is um, sometimes a tough one to swallow, but you sit back and you go, well, you know something? I get it. And we've got a good school here. If you all do a terrific job, but for the average taxpayer out there who wants to look at what we're getting for 50 cents on every dollar that I pay in taxes, I don't know if that if there's an equation. Um, and I I would uh, strongly encourage that. Um, somehow to marry this uh, with dollar perspective to what's going on in STEMs. What are we looking forward to uh, improve uh, the biology department, the chemistry department? The, um, yes, we hear a lot about phys ed and we got a new track and, and that's terrific. Um, but there are stronger components to the school than what's outside of it. So that's my value statement. Okay. And later on, we'll hear a presentation about some of the new initiatives we have going on in the school um, with our Innovative Pathways program um, and, and so on and so forth that we have people here that are going to present. So okay. we'll, we'll be bringing that. There's, I mean, there is, I hear what you're saying, but there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in our school. Our placement in two and four year colleges is around 70%. You know, we are doing well, and we're meeting the needs of so many different types of students in the school. So, I mean, I, mean, I guess I could add that statement to this. I, I mean, I'm, sometimes I'm preaching to people who know that. Um, and I don't know who's watching at home, but I mean, I hear what you're saying. It's a balance of people want to get into details of the budget, and some people will say you're getting a little too squishy with some of the other stuff and trying to brag about what we're doing. We're a very successful school, and just by the number of, I mean, you're balancing them out on other schools, with school choice itself, where people are valuing so much to trying to come in, we're to the point where we have to shut off admissions. Um, just shows you the kind of programming we're putting into our into our building. Um, it, it is also, I, I want to mention about tech, because towns need to realize this, because I think nobody, I, I don't know who the uh, the members of the regional tech uh, member, uh, their committee are, but they've increased their enrollment by 100 students in the last five years, while the county's gotten smaller. Every school in the county has gotten smaller, but tech has decided to get bigger. Mm -hmm. So that bill is going to continue to grow in each of your small towns because they're going to continue to, they can accept more and more students while we only can accept who are coming here as our you know, residents outside school choice. Yeah. So I'm just saying that, that that bill is increased because of the number, they've increased the number of students they're accepting. Um, and that's the value change of the county that where we want more tech students going into tech field into what they're offering and different things. And, I question people to be looking at that. You know, um, 
I'm, I'm looking at a different type of programming here uh, than what they're providing there, but I just want to say that out loud because that is, it is what's happening. That, that bill is going to continue to go up uh, because we're, as a county, saying we're valuing more students going to tech group rather than um, general college preparatory and um, uh, group there. So, yeah, just saying that out loud. Track and technology. What about the charter schools? Are you keeping headcount? So the charter schools have the same kind of same kind of pull. Right now, um, as we talk about, you know, we are paying off the debt, um, the one point, um, well, maybe one point three million dollars in the um, debt for the track and whatnot through school choice. And part of that is because the amount of money that we're spending on the bills of the students leaving this has gone down by thirty five percent. The number of students leaving this district to go to charter schools and choice out. Sometimes you have choice out just by a family member works in a, in a district or across the street from, uh, you know, I call it the, you know, a different school system so right on the border. Um, sometimes you have that, but the overall, um, the idea of choicing out over discontent, so to speak, is way down, as I said, it's down 35% as it was um, just a few years before COVID. So, you know, we're, we're, less students are going out and choosing those things. Um, the charter, we can go down the charter route about how that's funding and that funding formula and um, equal access to, you know, all students. But we're lucky right now. We don't have any in charter school. We do have people we in do. charter school. It's just down to 1%, which yeah. increases our At one time, we were upside down. Schools. We were paying more going out than coming in. Now we're getting. We are one of the few districts um, in Mass, well, well, certainly in the area that is, our revenue is higher coming in than it's going out. Most of our neighboring towns are paying more out to charter and choice. We actually um, are able to um, you know, have savings there and then we've recently been paying off capital projects with that and not sitting on a good camera. So, um, and obviously paying off that debt that we brought up. Is that a good thing? It's a very good thing because, right. in my opinion, it's a very good thing because without the debt, we're gonna be able to control year to year um, what kind of capital improvements we have. We've taken this building that is, you know, it's reached its midlife, it's reached its midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. um, we've replaced the boilers. We're now in the process of reporting parts to the roof. Um, you look at the carpet and furniture that's been replaced for the next 20 years. Um, you know, HVAC systems are being updated, you know. So a couple more, the big pieces are being fixed. Um, obviously, our, you know, you saw our parking lot as you came in, it, it, it's due, but we've kind of put that off because that, as I look at it, I look at, what we do inside the building is the most important. Student programming is most important. You know, a couple of potholes um, we can work around. Um, and that, so those are the kind of the big things that are going on. So this building is going to be reset for the next 20 years. Um, you know, we don't have to be saving money for the boiler breaking down because we have three brand new boilers. We don't need to be saving money for you know, you know that kind of thing. You still have to worry about parsons of the roof and that kind of stuff. We're not completely there yet, but at this point moving forward, there's no current debt. You know, we can open up more if, it, if we decide to take on any other projects or other concerns. We've got each um, school choice um, incoming. What, what's the capacity of the school if you just open the doors? And now I know there's a limit. As the <coughs> state sets a limit as to how many you can, how many school choice you can pull now. No, we can pull as many as we want. So we basically the the number we create is based on our middle school. So we get most of our students are coming to school choice from our elementary schools. We, we will get maybe another 10 or so in seventh grade. Um, we cap the seventh grade um, so that our class size is, George, help me out, or is that 18 to 20? Yeah. Around 18 to 20 yeah. per class. So we cap that out. And what happens is, so we carry those two numbers through, and then that number will drop off as we lose, in ninth grade, we'll lose the tech. And then some people will make different uh, high school decisions at that point. As we, you know, private schools usually people go to, you know, they're going to, um, you know, private uh, high school, that kind of thing. So that number, so right now our number is for middle school between around 115. We leave a few spots open for, you can get to up to 120. That is really our cap. Um, but we leave a little bit for residents. We don't go over and have class sizes too large. So, um, so the driver in the system is not only the elementary, but also the end result being frontier that it can continue with. So they see a value there. So they see a value in having their children attend our elementary schools and 
coming here. Um, and that value, um, I think these, you can promote that um, to a greater extent than what it is being promoted. And uh, Franklin Tech has done that pretty well. Um, so I think the opportunity is there. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have to balance the amount of school choice we bring in because it can over, overload the elementary schools when we start building entire classes that are purely school choice and they're only having $5,000 that comes in, it can overwhelm an elementary school. So there's a balance of how much we actually can take. Hey, Keith brings up a good point. So um, right now our elementary schools are shrinking in size. Um, Deerfield used to be three sections per grade level. Um, and Sunderland used to be two sections per grade level. And Deerfield reached a point where um, the amount of school choice they had where they it didn't, it happened like in one or two cases, but you almost had a full class of school choice. So now we reduce that the number of classes in the elementary school, which means the number of school choice being brought up to the system is going to come down over the next years. So the, I call it the windfall of revenue that we got from the amount of school choice, that number is gonna start coming down because um, our population is coming down. So we're only rounding out a class that's already in, that's happening. So depending on what your enrollment is, you know, if you have a class of um, 12 students from town, you know, we're going to try to add the up to six school choice to get a class of 18, 18 to 20, for the, you know, younger grades, a little bit more for the higher, uh, you know, four, five, six, or five, six. Um, so, but those, the number of sending classes is coming down, so the number of school choice is going to come down over the next few years as well. So, um, it, it, it does become that balance of like, you know, you, it, it's more difficult at the secondary level to look at you know, what is the impact of school choice after they leave middle school? Because middle school, they're still grouped by, that's why we kind of use that as the measuring stick. Um, we play plenty of room in the high school, and you just have less people moving their sophomore year. And you know, they kind of got themselves established. We get a few here and there, but you know, how many kids are taking, you know, you know, AP history versus, you know, regular US history? How many are school choice, how many are that? At that point, they get scattered about, and you don't really know. But, you know, we do the measuring stick this class size piece on middle school. So. I just thought I'd bring that up because it spreads the cost. And it, you know, it reach down. And, uh, Any other questions or comments before we close? Yeah. Could you speak a little bit to how value is being added or voids are being filled by adding the AD and the professional development budget? Sure, so the question was um, the added benefit of the AD and the stipends. Um, I'll start with the athletic director. Um, it's Right now, we, in the last few years, we've added athletics. We've added um, boys tennis from a co-ed team where we had a few boys playing on the girls team to a full participation there. We've added indoor track um, during the winter, which has 80-something um, something, something participants in it. Um, and we've... Boys volleyball. Added boys volleyball unified and unified basketball. Unified basketball, um, you know, students with different needs, uh, you know, being able to participate in athletics. So more, every single one of them, they're scheduling, hiring uh, of, of coaches, scheduling games, facilities. Um, you know, those are just things the athletic does. Medical forms, you know, all the different, you know, making sure uh, uh, physicals, all those kind of things. Every single sports kind of going on. So every single change. And then. Frontier also has the uh, blessing curse of being a very successful athletic school. The amount of postseasons that we're in um, across the board is the additional amount of games that require the next level of supervision and setup and orchestrating. So it really is a full-time job um, here at Frontier. I think the um, right now we're trying to balance it out about 80 percent full-time and trying to adjust that. Um, we are going to have to work with the union because it is in the contract written differently. Um, Right now we have a one year um, uh, memorandum of understanding to move away from the contract because we were caught in that position where when Carl Sear, who uh, was the previous athletic director, left as athletic director, we did post, we didn't have any applicants you know, to, to do that, but to do the stipend position so that we made a um, part-time position. And right now we're seeing that 
could really use a joint joint. And I can speak to the other the other part. Sure. You're asking about the you're asking about professional development. And so basically, what we've been what we've been paying with the ESSER funds, we're looking to basically <coughs> add it to the budget now has to do it. So we we have uh, somebody that's been coming in that's been working functioning as a as a coach with our newer teachers. Uh, has been going in, observing, uh, providing feedback, and been, we've been doing that for all of the new teachers coming into the building. It's been really beneficial. Um, teachers that have had have worked with with the coach um, yeah, have have actually uh, expressed interest in staying with him if they could. Um, so that's been really beneficial. And we also have teachers that are getting stipends for uh, basically doing uh, what we call TSD, which is basically they're working with groups of students. Uh, at the high school level now that are that are struggling academically uh, they're tracking their grades they're uh, coordinating with their teachers they're helping them so we're trying to do it basically to help as, as sort of like as an intervention uh, as an academic inter intervention as well to help some of our, our most struggling students and it makes so, yeah. to add on to that the, the, the need to support early teachers has never been more critical the market uh, for teachers if you read in the paper is very real you know when um, I started this position um, we had an English position open, I'd have it over 100 applicants, and you had to you know, pick, a, pick up the, the stack, so to speak, and now that number is, is falling almost down to single digits when we have, maybe not so much for English, but other types of positions. You really need to support for teacher burnout. We lose most, we don't lose, the profession loses most teachers in the first three years. So you know, we're investing in the future of keeping good people on. So I think, you know, it's not a lot of money overall, um, but I think that's one of the things we're looking at, that we put that program in using as for money to support those teachers, especially supporting them when it was a very, um, we were in a kind of, teaching was in a crisis going through COVID and coming out of COVID. Um, so it's good to give them that extra support. So that's my sales pitch on that. One more thing with the AD slash PE teacher position is that it will allow us to offer some additional PE health athletic related classes as well, right? You're talking about um, adding a sports, sports medicine, medicine, sports management. Sports medicine and sports management and sports medicine we're looking to add we're looking at so the current two of the current PE teachers are looking to teach those uh, we're looking to add so the AD who's going to be functioning as a part-time phys ed teacher as well it's going to be picking up about one and a half classes per semester it's going to be helping out teaching middle school PE as well which is going to be great because even uh, because oftentimes we've had to fill those roles with non PE teachers um, and it would be great to have somebody that's licensed to do it for us and, and just for perspective, uh, I'm a teacher and a coach at Amherst and observe what the athletic director does there. And when this was uh, brought up, I did not think it was a good idea to have the, the athletic director as a part-time teacher. I thought that that responsibility would be too much. That, that was pushed back again to try to, to, to save the budget a little bit, but it, it's a job that requires late nights. They're here all night, every day for for a variety of games, it's a, it, and there's a lot of pressure on it. Safety and liability are really important. Um, so I, I respect the position that you know, Darius and Shelley took about having to try to balance the PE teacher and the athletic director, but in, for full disclosure, in all conversation, there was discussion about like, it really should be a full-time position. Any other questions or comments? Where are we dressing? With regard to, as uh, Phil Cantor pointed, you know, the DESI funding formula, especially with outliers of our quality income that skew the uh, funding and the perception, is there a formal bill that has been proposed for the Massachusetts legislature? Or if not, are you working with other rural regions uh, to put that forth? Because if it is, I would make a motion that we'll start in Conway to uh, endorse it and move it up the ladder, so to speak, to uh, get something going. Yeah, so the question was regarding, you know, what's going on legislatively regarding Chapter 70. Um, you, you know, know I, what's that? So you know that Jessica's behind that poll in case you need back up. Yes, <laughs> you know, yeah, Jessica into it. So the, I will say I attend a lot of meetings regarding um, with state legislators, legislators and um, other, you know, professionals within constituents within the, uh, not constituents, but uh, people who work with the state legislature developing the budgets, they aren't gonna touch chapter seven. Um, it, it's too, it's got too many bandages on it, I think, for them to open it up right now, especially right now the way um, the economic climate is. 
right now we're putting a lot of our cards into rural aid, and, uh, and, and Ms. was referring to Jessica, who serves as the chair of Sunderland, um, is a big part of trying to work uh, advocacy for getting the rural aid bill to be hired and be funded at 60 million instead of 15 million. Um, right now there's a setback there, as, the, as, as you may know, the state's in a uh, financial shortfall right now, and so everybody's trying to get some of those dollars. So. Um, but that's where we are seeing probably in the future that, that we want to get that rural aid so that we can depend upon it. We can use that to offset the budget. If we can use rural aid to offset the budget annually, um, that, that piece of the pie will grow to almost probably 40% will be funded by the state if we use that directly. The problem is that we can't guarantee it from year to year. So we haven't used it in that way. So we're going to be using it this year as a way to offset the, the debt. And then we're going to be looking at, I'm talking about Frontier now. Um, and then um, next year, you know, we'll be looking at using that. Hopefully, it'll come in at least the same as it is this year, which is just short of two hundred thousand. Um, we can maybe use it to offset the budget. Um, at the elementary, they're already they're using it in multiple different ways at the four schools. You have to attend one of those meetings there. So there is talk about looking at at the funding formula as the health harmless. So maybe they'll look at Chapter Seventy and health harmless um, differently because the amount of schools that are affected similar to us. In some schools, they've been gone, lost one. So they're coming in with a deficit the way because of inflation. Um, so there is talk about that. I don't know, Justin, do you know if there's any any traction on that? <laughs> traction. <laughs> traction on that? Uh, there's no new news since last week. The, there was a bill specifically about rural schools and rural aid, um, and it just came out last week from the Joint Committee on Education. They reported favorably on an updated version of the bill that took out the rural aid and took out full regional transportation reimbursement and took out the special education financing commission and all of the things that had major money attached so it's really been weakened it's it's no longer really appropriate to call it a rural schools bill um so we have we haven't fully regrouped we don't know where we're going next yet are there any western mass delegates that serve in that committee oh that that oh on that committee yeah. uh there was Smitty Pignatelli from Southern Berkshire County, and he is not running for re-election. Um, there is nobody else from Western Mass serving on the Joint Committee on Education. And I will say both Natalie, um, Natalie uh, Blake and uh, Joe Comer are completely understand rural aid in the financing of schools, and they are 100% pushing for the rural aid bill and behind it. They are so well informed. They intend, we're crossing paths at so many of these meetings. Um, so they have been doing their best, but you know they oversee dozens of towns versus Eastern Mass, where they have the population. So they have really stepped up to try to find short-term fixes. So they are trying to get rural aid increased from the 15 million that's in the governor's budget, so the rural aid could still go up there. Trying to get the minimum aid per pupil, the whole harmless, to go from $30 to $100 per pupil. They've never succeeded in reaching 100 per year, but. They're trying. They're fighting the good fight for short-term solutions, and then we'll figure out long-term things. Thank you. Thank you. And just so, so the 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 breakfast that or the, the thing that lost Bur uh, Beacon Hill comes to the Berkshires in the first week of April for Saturday in April, I think. The chair of the Joint Committee on Education is going to be there, and there is a belief, at least from one of our state senators, that uh, there is a potential to get that formula tweaked so that. To, to leave it revenue neutral, but to reduce the amount that is that, that goes from that comes from the income and increase the amount that comes from property value. Um, that the revenue neutral things tend to be easier for Eastern Mass to digest. Yep. Um, so, all right. I dare say. Other <laughs> comments or questions? Do you have anything on that? Really quick, we're going to close the public hearing on the proposed budget for fiscal year 25. We will be back on Thursday to vote on that, but now we will open uh, 7:15 for notes. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, you will not. Yes, we can totally. Uh, you know, uh, but, yeah. Um, Thank you, everybody from the Finance Committee, both for your support, but also for attending and listening to 
everything that Shelly has presented. And Shelly, thank you so much for all of the work that you do, not just to present at these kinds of meetings, but also to make sure that we all understand what it is that we're doing here. All right, my only concern in that break was that uh, we got a student on here, but Addison, if you can hang on it for five minutes, we'll take a quick break and be right back. Yes. I have got minutes well, here. Public yeah, so am I making the minutes like stop and then we start for Thursday, or am I doing two different minutes for today and Thursday? No, it's we posted it as one, so do it as one. Okay. It's just the public hearing that's closed as that agenda item. Okay. And then we're opening up the regular meeting. Great. Let me just clarify because he's asking about oh, Thursday. Oh, just Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, yes, that's okay. Entirely separate. It's an entirely separate. Okay. So general yes. so I'll another. close this this one down. And then submit that. Do another one for Thursday. Great. Sorry. All right. I need a motion to review and approve the minutes of February 13, 2024. So moved. Second. All in favor? So updated. Oh yeah. There you go. You fell off the big screen. You're on the little screen. Huh. We have two uh, folks who want to try to move around on the agenda. One, um, Addison, you still with us? Oh, bless your heart. Thank you for hanging in there. That was a bit longer than 20 to 30 minutes. Go for it. Give us your updates. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep this quick. Uh, we don't really have too much that we've been doing recently. We're still working on the uh, students faculty uh, basketball game. And we've definitely been getting into that a lot. Um, I, I think that's generally about it. We've been doing a lot of, um, we are, uh, for like, I'm sorry, this week actually, um, me and another student are going to a Massachusetts Student Council uh, conference. We've been promoting a lot of those, and I think that they are becoming more of a thing in student council. And I think uh, students have been do like joining these a lot, a lot more often. I'm sorry, hang on. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we've been doing too much, except like from too much more than last month. We've definitely been getting into the. Um, basketball game a lot more, though. Great. And when's that basketball game? That basketball game is on April 4th, I believe. I, I, let me check. Hang on. It's April 6th. April, April 6th. 6th. All right. Great. Mark your calendars. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy the conference. It's fun to just share thoughts with everybody else and learn from other groups. Thank you, Addison. Thank you. And we have Christine. Is that? Christine, you're going to go next. Can we just join right here? Or well, George can introduce. Yeah, I can yeah, go Christine. So Christine <laughs> okay. is our community outreach coordinator. This is. So she started working with us last year. She started with us full time this year. She's been doing a fantastic job. So she basically uh, has, uh, helps out a lot. Um, with our Innovative Pathways program in addition to other things. So uh, she's going to be talking tonight about Innovative Pathways and what we've been doing um, and what we brought to the school and what she's been able to help coordinate uh, as well. And I just I couldn't say, I can't say enough great things about her. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Christine, and thank you for all the hard work that you've been doing with the Innovative Pathways program. We really appreciate it. So, so I'm Christine Wu. Uh, I am the community outreach coordinator, it's kind of a mouthful, but my job is to go out and create relationships with businesses in the community to enhance programs here. I work with two programs. Uh, I work with the special ed vocational program, so kids in the special ed program, if they want vocational experience before they leave school, I help them find internships or job placements. I'm also the coordinator for uh, programs in the Innovation Pathways program. I bring in guest speakers, organize field trips, and get kids the internships they need to finish their program. Uh, I believe you guys got the brochures uh, last time that explained what Innovation Pathways is. I'll give you a brief overview and then tell you where we're at with it. 
Um, it's funded through DESI, and basically DESI and the Department of Labor took a look at the blueprint, the labor blueprint for Massachusetts, and identified a couple years ago five tracks of in-demand uh, businesses in Massachusetts where the most growth uh, and the most need for employees now and in the coming years is. I believe they've added two tracks to it recently. So I think there's seven tracks that high schools can apply for all together. We have two of them. We have advanced manufacturing and engineering, and we have healthcare and social sciences. Uh, kids will complete combination of classwork and an internship to complete the program. I'll tell you a little bit about the classes. They offer, uh, we offer technical classes and advanced classes. They have to take two technical classes and they have to take two advanced classes. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about what those are, <laughs> they're in here, I won't bore you with reading them all out. But uh, like computer-aided design programming, fab lab, these are our technical classes. The advanced classes for advanced uh, manufacturing and engineering, physics, advanced computer science, regular physics, biotechnology. So they take two technical and two advanced classes, but they're of course welcome to take anything else on the menu to fill out their uh, learning. In healthcare and social sciences, some of the technical classes include first aid, CPR, uh, first uh, health aid trainer, Obviously, the advanced classes, you've got your AP Bio, AP Chemistry, AP Anatomy. So once the kids finish their technical and advanced classes, they're eligible for their internship. Those will primarily take place in the spring of their senior year. There are a few exceptions because there are some companies who would like the students in the summer. And if the student can swing that, we're going to try to make that work for them. In addition to the classes, we bring in a lot of guest speakers. One of the things we're trying to do is keep this very experiential, very hands-on. The teachers we have working in these programs are great. Uh, we have a lot of equipment that the kids are learning to run and use. We have uh, a laser cutter in the uh, lab. We have 3D printers. We have this giant CNC wood router. In the healthcare labs, we have full-size mannequins that are interactive, hospital beds, blood pressure equipment, CPR dummies. We're really well equipped. But in addition to that, we bring in guest speakers who enhance these classes, professionals in the field. Uh, some of the ones who have come in in the past couple weeks are um, the aquatics director for Northampton, and he talks about how CPR and first aid is put into use in the field and careers with that you can used with CPR and first aid. We've had people come in to talk about uh, medical lab work, medical technician work, and what it takes to be a lab worker. He brings in blood sample pictures and helps kids identify you know, who's got the most white blood cells, things like that. So it's very experiential. Uh, we have a growing panel of uh, guest speakers. We have over 35 businesses involved in one way or another with manufacturing and engineering and another 35 involved with healthcare. If you're curious who's on our list, who, what businesses are working with us, you can take a peek. Um, I'll just kind of, you can share them. I'll pass them out to you. Uh, we are always open to suggestions of more businesses who might offer internships or speakers or tours. We take two tours a semester. As you can see, a lot of variety. Uh, we take them to, uh, with manufacturing and engineering, we take them to builders, to manufacturers in the community, uh, technical companies. With the healthcare, uh, we have two in-house uh, events that are big. Some of you uh, who are in the school may have seen a helicopter land here <laughs> last semester. The Lifestar helicopter lands and gives the healthcare students a tour of the helicopter, tells them about job opportunities in that field, lets them get their hands in there. South County EMS comes over, they let them tour the ambulance, again, talk to them about careers, how to get into them, what's required in terms of education for these careers. We're gonna be doing a, a simulation, so to speak, We'll have a, a student volunteer to be Johnny who fell out of the tree, and what does EMS do when they arrive? 
They'll actually describe how they would check him for concussion, dizziness, broken bones, how would they load him, what, the, what can they do in the ambulance. These are highly interactive and they've been very popular. We've gotten a lot of good feedback from the kids. Uh, one of the favorite ones uh, for the manufacturing and engineering is a trip to UMass and they get to go to their 3D fabrication labs, their maker spaces, their computer science department, their design build center, learn a little bit about what careers they could plan for by going to those programs and seeing what sort of equipment is out there. The healthcare also goes to Bay State Medical. We have a mock patient admission program. Kids break up into groups of fives and they'll get a fakey patient. Mr. Jones is 68. He has a history of diabetes, he injured his hip, et cetera, et cetera. He's gonna go to PT. One of the students actually gets to be Mr. Smith and PT will show the students what they would do for this person. He's having pain. He might have a broken hip. He's gonna go to the radiology department. So we all go to radiology. We see what would be done in terms of x-rays or MRIs. We got to watch a live MRI. He needs surgery. They gloved up and gowned up, went into a surgical suite, learned about the different careers in the surgical suite, what education is required to do those jobs, etc. They got to play around with the tools with a mannequin. So we try to keep it as interactive as possible and very engaging. It's been very, very popular. We've had a lot of good feedback about our program so far. We have kids uh, the, in the manufacturing and engineering. We have six enrolled at this time and we have four enrolled in healthcare. We have a lot of other students who are kind of on the border of signing up, so it is growing. Uh, it, it is, as I said, a very popular program, very hands-on. We've gotten a lot of good feedback. We've had some interesting comments. We always do a review at, at the end of these special events, and it, it's really been inspiring to see how these kids react to seeing what they're learning in the classroom in action in these factories. When we go out to a place for a field trip, I provide that company with the vocabulary and the curriculum of what's going on that semester so they can integrate it into that field trip. And it's amusing when we went over to Pelican last fall to see the kids as these people are talking about their design process, production, and testing. The kids are all nodding because, yep, I remember learning that, yep, and they're pointing to their teacher like, yep, you told us this. And uh, it was kind of cute that the next day, uh, Kevin Murphy, who is a computer science and computer aid design teacher, he said one of the students came in saying, I'm so psyched for class today. This is gonna be great. And he thought, all right, what are you buttering me up for? Do you wanna leave early? What's the deal here? And she said, no. She goes, I was so fascinated by what they design over there and what comes out of there. She goes, I can't wait to see what I can create in here today. So it was really, it's really been an effective tool. Uh, kind of a little side story, an interesting effect of the healthcare tour of the helicopter and the ambulance. We figured as long as they're here, we'd let the special ed kids come out and see these vehicles. There was one young man who has had an extreme fear of doctors and anything medical. He's high on the autism spectrum. He got to tour these on his own terms, rather than being the patient or the client all the time. I don't know how many of you know much about autism, but they don't engage in pretend play. They're very logical, very uh, whatever's in front of them is in front of them. He went home and started pretend playing with an ambulance, which he had never done in his life. He's 18 years old. And his mother was in tears because something moved him to try pretend play. He also wanted to know more. He was asking more questions. This experience of getting out there on his own terms opened a door for him and reduced some fears. I was able to bring in a medical doctor to the special ed department to let these kids play doctor. He brought in the stethoscope, blood pressure cuffs, and I forget what they're called, the otoscopes, whatever they are for the eyes and ears. That's it. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> and they were able to play doctor for the day, getting a, you know, honorary title for the day and take the blood pressure of their teachers and it reduced some fear. So it's sort of a side effect of bringing more experiential learning into the school that we didn't bargain for, but it was really pretty cool that that happened. Um, if you have questions, if you, don't have, if you didn't see the brochures, we do have some, I'll leave them here. You can take a peek at them, see what the courses are. Um, and like I said, those are the lists I, I, of the businesses involved. So I do have a question. Just yeah, the, absolutely. The one 
I, I see you have someone coming in that's uh, vet and animal science. Yes. And if there is one curriculum offering that this school could do, just from, because every year we always have it, in, from, in Conway at least, we always have one to two kids that just to, to study that go end up going to Smith Book um, because Franklin Tech has historically not offered that. And when your kid in your town goes to Smith Vogue, and that's not your District tech, your, your, um, that that choice costs the town over forty thousand dollars a year, but in tuition and transportation. So that would be a great thing to to because that 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 need is always there year after year. There's always one, two, three, or more going for just that, and it costs us a fortune. We saved a girl from going out. She is going to be. Uh, veterinary technician and possibly going to vet school. I've already worked out an internship for her at Deerfield uh, uh, Veterinary Service over by Yankee Candle, wow. not the emergency one. Um, so yeah, we're, to the best of our ability, keeping kids who are interested in some sort of healthcare or social science counseling, rehab counseling, engineering, manufacturing, keeping those kids here to get their hands-on experience here. Uh, the great part about this program is it really is good for any level kid, whether you're the kid who wants to go into the factory and press the buttons when you have to get out of high school, you're going to be the kid entering the program in and running that machine, or whether you want to design things and whether you want to, you know, be the engineer, this prepares you to go off to engineering school. So it's, it works for both ends of the spectrum. It's great because it does provide them this hands-on experience. It's a great resume builder, college application builder. And to be frank, how many of us are doing jobs that we first went into college to study? No hands. It gives these kids a sense of, is this something I really wanna do? Is this a good fit for me? I know so many people who have paid thousands and thousands of dollars to universities only to get through with that study, take the job and say, I don't really like this. This is a great way for them to get their fingers wet. They don't have to go into this career, but it's a great way for them to test out, is this a good avenue for me? Any other questions? What's your, what's your capacity? You talked about your current enrollment. What's the capacity in both programs? I don't know if we have established capacity. Yeah, capacity. Basically, you know, it, would be, it, would, it could go up to however many students can fit in a class if you think about it. So I mean, um, you know, it could be, 15, 20, 25, so yeah. Um, I know a lot of students are really, I mean, I'm assuming too, I'm just looking back at them, I didn't even realize the new map that's back there. I'm sure that that was done on, in Dan Murphy's oh, room probably. on the yeah. CNC yeah. machine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's like a lot of kids are taking advantage of it. They really enjoy it. And I'll say from uh, my parental role, I do some work with the elementary kids, bringing them over for math and science fest, and it's been such a great experience for the kids. And, sixth grade to come over and kind of get a sense of what the opportunities may be with. Okay. That's great, so. that's great. Yeah, we're, we're doing our best to get the word out around the school. It's a new thing. We're at the end of our second year. So I will say that no one is in an internship yet. No one has reached that point yet. That'll all happen next year. Um, but it's going very well. There's growing excitement. And as kids are taking these classes and they're catching on to what is Innovation Pathways? And, like, why would I want to do this versus just take some of the classes? The big thing is the internship to get that experience. Um, and also, just on their end, we're uh, going to have you know, a graduation cord and a specialization line on their diploma, which they have. You know. But yeah, I would, fantasy, I would love to see a window in the fab lab for the printer to run and people in the hallway can see it. Okay. You know, so that kids could see what's really going on in there. We've had kids do some fascinating projects. Uh, I'm mind blown by some of the things the kids are doing. Uh, we have a kid coming up with an alternative engine. We have one that's redesigned a golf club head. I mean, they're really fascinating kids that are really getting deep into this and loving it. And it's, it's, it's been a great offering. And I hope more kids will catch on to this and, and sign up as, as work gets out. Any other questions? personal to me, I would prefer that you take off the apostrophe S on the PAs that are on your list. It's not how the profession is spelled. Uh, the physician okay. assistant. There's no apostrophe S on there. Uh, where am I seeing? And the healthcare. Tim Kang will appreciate that 
appropriate title for position. Oh, Tim, he's yeah, okay. A, he's just a position assistant. Oh, for, okay. Yeah. So, he's a physician no, assistant. Yes. Okay, We're physician assistant. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good to know. Just so you know, this is my database. That's fine. But, I, I so but that's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to know that. that. So actually, when I introduce him, that I'm saying it properly. I'm glad to know that. Um, this list is ever growing, but I encourage you, if you do know businesses in the community that are manufacturers, engineers, uh, civil engineers, what have you, uh, healthcare professionals that might be interested in uh, helping us expand our program and deepen the, the learning, I would love to have those names. Um, it's been a really great response from the community, as you can see. As mentioned, these are high demand careers. Hospitals are desperate for employees, for a, for a path for people to go into uh, medical work. Manufacturers always have openings. Uh, these, are, these are careers where they really need employees, so they're more than happy to be working with us in one capacity or another, either with tours, guest speakers, or, or uh, um, internships to help cultivate these kids. So, but we're always looking for more, so keep it in mind. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice job. And pardon me for blubbering through it. I don't want to keep you guys forever, so uh, I was trying to try to rush it. You so. didn't blubber. You didn't blubber at all. <laughs> you very good. We know what we're doing for Thank you. This is where you were referring to marrying what was going on with the budget with what's going on at the school as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard. There's a lot going on. It's, you know, that's important yeah. to some people. Will, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Musical next week is more important to other people. Totally. The basketball game last night, you know, I mean, like it's. And you know, some people only want to do the numbers. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you do like a greatest hits, like two minute video, slideshow. You've got to do something. Second year scrub up. All right. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah. 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 All right. Financial statement and words. That's you again, Shelley. You ready? Or oh, you want me to skip over I'm, some things? Or, no, so I can be ready. All right. Um, I have nothing for FY23 financial <laughs> statements. I didn't even send you the report, so that's my apologies. Because it's supposed to be 24. 24. 24. Yeah. You're right. It's not 23. It's See, I'm tired no, now. It's not 23. It's 744. Um, and I've been drowning a little bit this week. But anyway, I do have warrant total for you. For you, 28 warrants were signed totaling $2,726,509.70. And I already put that in the for you. They were, they were, and it was um, signed this morning. Thank you. But we are going to add budget discussion back here, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're going to stick with that FY25 conversation to follow up. What a circle back on. Any comments from the public here to have a discussion? Quick question I had coming out of that. So, school choice if someone from Deerfoot chooses to go to tech, that impacts them specifically? Now, if, if someone's school choice is to Frontier, we, who's that? Deerfield. No, Sydney Town. So, yeah. tech is not the, a school choice school. Tech, you pay tuition okay. to go to. So, the town okay. pays full tuition of whatever the cost to attend. Um, I don't have to say whether they go or not. Which, no. let, me re let me rephrase that. So they get assessed based on enrollment for a new town because Deerfield is part of, and Conway and Sutherland are part of their member towns, just like they're part of our member towns. For Smith Boat, what Phil was saying is we pay the full cost for a student to go to there. But in the end, it ends up working out to be so that's not a choice. That's totally different. School choice and tech enrollments are entirely different pieces. You have to apply to go to tech. You still apply for school choice, but it's not the same process. It's not the same, but I mean, if you follow it down to fundamentals, they have to pay the dollars to the outgoing student versus like, from a global perspective in our community, we get, we get funding for students coming here of school choice, but it's not specific to town, right? No, so what happens with the um, assessment from the state is the state automatically takes choice money from the town. It's 
is deducted from their revenue, but the town actually pays tech directly, like they pay Frontier directly. It's the same thing that happens with us. They get assessed by Franklin Tech for the number of students that attend. But the game, you're, you're correct to say that the game is different. You know, why is each student worth a certain amount of money and then get sent to whatever whatever they choose. I don't know if you're kind of going that route. I was just wondering where the, the dollars are pooled. If it's so, if it's full choice dollars, do they is it hitting Frontier? So the dollars that are coming in hit Frontier, or or if, let's say school kids are school choicing out of Conway to go to wherever. Does it Conway pay it, or is it Frontier Regional that we pay? At the elementary school, Conway or let's say pays, high school Frontier Frontier pays. So that's a difference to me. <laughs> Deerfield pays for tech, whereas if someone's school choice somewhere else, Frontiers pay. Right, so if someone goes to Greenfield, yes. if someone, if a Deerfield resident chooses to go to school in Greenfield and gets in through school choice, Frontier is assessed that $5,000. But if a Deerfield resident chooses to go to Franklin Tech, the town pays that. Because the towns are in agreement with Franklin Tech. Just like we have a regional agreement, they yeah. have and it's not like you can say, well, geez, that's, you know, we're going to have to negotiate. There's no negotiation with Franklin Tech. It's what, this is the number you're going to pay. Versus, well, te versus well, technically, they give you a budget, and you guys vote on it every year at town meeting, just nobody, right. No one puts a hold on that one. Because there's, <laughs> there's correct me if I'm wrong, there's 26 towns. Yeah, right. And if you're the one that doesn't want to vote for it, too bad. It's just no like us. Right. If we have three out of the four, the long, the long soldiers out. But the other thing about them too is that their school committee is so large and no single town has more than like a five or six percent voting share uh, that they, they effectively have no financial pushback at, at, ever on anything from their school committee. Um, and the other, the other thing too is that, uh, that we have a tradition of returning some of the extra E and D, extra some of the E and D that's not spent to the towns to lower their assessment. Um, Frank, Franklin Tech does not do that. They looked at me like I was from Mars when I suggested that, that they do that. Um, and in fact, when you, you listen to them give their presentations, they actually look at E and D like it's Christmas, and they just they go shopping and they get like stuff that they, they, they expand their offerings that they weren't even thinking. Let's buy a helicopter. They do that with E and D. Um, and you know, so that's. I don't want to get too far into yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah, yeah. budget, but do you want to talk a little bit more about what Julie was yes, saying? Yes, let's talk about that. So Julie had wrote, written Darius and I earlier in the week with this question: of, Can we change the hundred thousand dollar assessment of capital over to a debt assessment and not assess them for capital? The reasoning behind that is because debt excluded funds can result in a tax increase of one time. And as she explained, it's already been approved when each of the towns approved that funding years ago for $1.8 million. So it does not have to go back out for vote of the community. The town just has to figure out how to fund it. Whereas with capital, that would have to be a warrant article and they would have to fund it, raise an appropriate free cash or, you know, um, So instead of, control. so what we will be doing is instead of paying down $100,000 of the debt assessment that we had planned to do, um, you know, 100000 that we were going to assess the town, we will use school choice. I'll just pick a fund. We'll use school choice, 100000 there. Um, Instead of the debt assessment, we'll get the debt assessment to the town, and we'll use 100,000 school choice to pay for the fire panel. Right. There'll be no warrant gone to the town. We'll just assess them so a larger amount. So the 40,000 will charge them 140,000 dollars worth the debt assessment. So, Keith, you had your hand. You you beat me to the hand up like by like 10 seconds. Uh, does that have to be applicable to all four towns, or would it be done to do it individually? You know, how, we would how do, does that affect the other? We would do all four towns. So give them all the same amount. It's the same bill, it's just how they can pay for it. It gives them more leeway for paying for it. She's correct, it gives them more leeway without having to raise, put is that it, against the two and a half. Is this a precedent for the future? Mm -hmm. Like, 
Is this going to happen more often than not now? Well, we're in the unique opportunity that we have a debt assessment that we're I doubt we're going to be paying off debt assessments like that in the future. So we have the ability to do that this year because there's a debt assessment. The only thing I wish we would have done today when we talked about paying, correct me if I'm wrong, paying the interest, the $400,000 interest thing that we're taking care yeah. of, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not assessing, assessing the town to 400000 from the loans. Right. You know, I think, I think they should have known that we spent four hundred thousand dollars of our money to pay take care of that, correct? Well, it'll be nine hundred. Nine hundred thousand. That was it, but what? yes, but I. But think see, that's something they should have known about. We've had we, they're, they're picking over a hundred thousand dollars over here, but we also. So took they they've discussed that we sent we met with the town administrators. That committee that comes up with it came up with that plan. Right. So right. So. They, the town, we met with the, we met one day of a representative on that committee that made the decision in the select board. We met with the town administrators and we sent the slideshow over to town administrators to send to both finance and select board. So they've seen the full presentation about what we are doing. So they knew about it. I, and Keith that, was right, that, like, we probably should have, Keith mentioned it in between to me, so he could probably should have gone out a little bit further. It was a chance to talk about it more because it is pretty significant. So, like, Shelly wasn't already doing enough. You know what I mean? So, like, we probably, you know, we could have done that, but there's only, I mean, it was, it was an hour, it was, you know, it was, you know, it was, you know, it was an hour and 20 minutes. I think they should already. I think they should have known. I mean, they, they should know, but. But it wasn't the last presentation that you just gave. Yes. I mean, just, uh, but the, it was. it's not like they. You have, have you guys been to any of the towns yet? You got another shot at it. Right. And Deerfield chose to come to us last year. Yeah. Yes, we, um, so the, last week. The, the, the thing about the, what, what, what the finance committee member from Deerfield said is a reasonable, is a reasonable request. And it makes sense from the point of view of ease of getting the budget passed. But the way it was brought to this school committee, it would have been far better for the school if the select board made that formal request. Um, be, and the select board incurred the political risk and the political wrath at town meeting for making that request rather than setting the school committee up and the school for then having to defend that choice because uh, it was never actually properly made by the town. It was just one right here. And um, you know, to the extent that, that a debt exclusion is viewed by some, and you always hear this at every town meeting, it, as a gimmick to get around Prop 2 and a half, um, and I've heard that used over and over again at all our towns, that, you know, it's, it's now it's the school that will be seen as doing that rather than the town of Deerfield making that formal request, which is what it should have been, and so. Yeah. The, the one who needs the benefit is the so right for all four. You know, and Phil, you're right. I mean, you're right. That's the downside of it is that someone can say you can move around that. We are instead of putting a warrant item on for a hundred thousand dollars, we instead are just doing capital the the assessment, uh, the capital assessment cost of uh, cost sorry, debt approved debt yeah. assessment um, of one hundred forty thousand dollars. It's a little bit cleaner. I mean, it can be easily argued on town floor, and if we have to argue on town floor, we can explain why. And if they don't like it, they can let us know. They're, they're still, they have to pay for it either way. It's not even a choice. Because they've already agreed to that debt assessment. The other thing with the capital is we don't have final engineered specs on the fire alarm panel. We don't have a opinion of probable cost yet from the engineer. So I suppose um, this allows us more time and we would have, Frontier would have had to cover that bill anyway, but, you know, we're not. You're saying additional reasons why this is a good idea. Yes, I, I think it gives us more time with the capital project, too, to be able to fully fund it properly versus just assessing 100000 What if it comes back at 400000 which it shouldn't, but what if it did, you know, and then. We're going to have a lot of false alarms. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> so, no, no. That's a really good point, though. That's a really good point. The only, I think when we were talking about before, you know, setting a precedent having no capital requests whatsoever. Yeah. Like, I think we we're trying to avoid that when we were discussing it before, because, yeah. you know, three years a little bit, and now they get into a habit of not expecting any every year. 
we don't always going to have those funds available. So that, I think that was one of the reasons why we had it in there in the first place. So that's another potential downside, but I don't think it's huge. Are the other accounts under the understanding that they weren't going to have a capital assessment at all? No. They, they saw what was presented. Everyone has seen what was presented tonight, where it was general fund capital debt. That capital line. So after, more right, just like, yeah, I'm sorry. After we, after the February meeting, we send that complete packet because we've gotten pushback from the finance committee and so forth that they don't want to come here and be surprised at the public forum what the numbers are. So as soon as you guys decide what the numbers are, we send them all, all the paperwork. So they have, they have a full budget too, all the line items as well. So they knew exactly um, what we were assessing them for capital this year. And it won't change the assessment. It just changes how the town pays for it. We will still be assessing. For it's like the tennis courts. You know, they can pay any way they want. They can pay it with their cash. They can pay it with their CPA money. I mean, I guess it's the same thing with this. I mean, it's either debt or just pay it. So there's one other point too that I'm making on behalf of a uh, finance committee member from my town that couldn't be here on the thing tonight. That the belief that it's that it's actually it might not be the best decision to retire all the debt. Um, just from the point of view that what you want to do is budgetary speaking, you want to have new debt ready to come in when the old debt's getting retired, so that the budget impact is minimized. When you retire the debt, it comes off the budget. And then when you need to borrow more, it's that much harder to get approved because it has a much more, it has a much larger or outsized influence. Correct, and, that, and that's why we did. No, go ahead. And that's why we did a a warrant for the fire panel this year that we said, look, we're going to continue to have hundred thousand dollars at about where we were last year in what was the debt. Well, it was capital, the same amount of capital per year. Um, and that would have been eaten up by the debt assessments. We're asking, we have a general budget, and then what we're asking outside of that for either debt or capital has been around the same amount. It's a little bit higher. And don't forget, we still have funds available in that we haven't fully spent the $1.8 million. We still have the parking lot to tackle. The four hundred and five that we're paying off of the roof could be reallocated for the parking lot. So there's likely more debt coming, whether it's next year or two years will be in the capital the capital committee is going to have to make that decision that's going to be the next thing on the list the capital committee is like what do you want to do with the debt um, do, is it more appropriate to close it up do we keep it open and finish the parking lot which was originally part of that and we have three more phases of the roof so there's still plenty of significant projects that will likely require us to borrow because we are using a significant level of our reserves to do what we're going to do this year, paying off the debt and funding the roof phase one ourselves. And these two other projects now, right? Because it'll be the full fire panel and the full building management system. I sounded way too jolly earlier when I was trying to get it, wasn't it? <laughs> and do we need a vote to so the committee needs to vote to it needs to vote a number moving forward to bring to the bring to the vote next week, right? And if it wants to change two days from now, two days from now. And if you want us to change the wording to move the um, use the English language for me. Yeah, we don't have to change the wording. I just need them to. I'll show you guys the assessment on the screen, and we'll just you know, make the motion. Uh, yeah, actually, you don't even need to vote that next week. We will move that forward. We'll bring it to the. In two, no, next week. in two days, we will bring forward the changes as long as that's what you guys want to do. But I don't want to throw another wrench in it. The other option for the committee to consider, knowing that we've heard from at least one town that there is financial hardship, is is there any additional funding sources? And uh, Julie did say that at, at the end. Is there anything else the school committee can do to help us out? You know, I'm sure they'd rather have their assessments reduced overall versus just this change of capital. But all the other towns are, I mean, transportation, we're going to have that extra is, money for transportation at the elementary school, so. Right, that is definitely it's, something to consider. This is just one ball of fire right here. Wait till we get to the elementary the school. The capital is direct dollar for dollar, though. Uh -huh. So if, if you 
if there is, if they want to reduce, reducing the capital request is going to help the towns directly. You can't, you, the amount you have to reduce to change the assessment, you, you can't, it, it's not realistic, you, have, you know, you got to change by $200,000. No, the largest impact will be to Deerfield, but say we took another $100,000 of school choice money and paid that instead of assessing them 100000 on debt and only assess them 40000 100000 Deerfield's portion of that is 48, you know, 48% or whatever is on the slide before. So they're going to see the most significant relief if we were to do that. I'm just throwing another option out there, whereas if we're talking about truly giving relief to the town, especially knowing we talk, we talk what's happening with transportation at all the elementary schools. And we talk, and I think we talked about it during our capital meeting, correct me if I'm wrong, about taking another hundred thousand dollars, correct me if I'm wrong, to help with assessment, but it wouldn't help that much even if we took two hundred thousand. I think when we were talking about projects and right. the money that we have, if we're going to put we're going to reduce, if we're going to reduce, we do the town, we do it on the capital assessment, or the, the or, or the interest. Uh, that that directly will be dollar for dollar savings. If you try to reduce the budget, the amount you have to reduce to overcome the assessment isn't. It's but very the, difficult. The fire panel is only a hundred thousand dollars, correct? About a hundred thousand dollars. The total project is going to be probably two hundred. Okay, two hundred your percent or half. So let's look at what the change is. So if we were to pull off a hundred thousand dollars, let's just say from debt, since we're talking about moving it to debt anyway. Currently, our overall assessment, it was 3.83, am I remembering that right? It would bring us down to 2.75 overall. It's a significant difference. It doesn't impact each of the towns in the same way. I can't find the slide here. My numbers are right. Um, but when you're talking about our overall increase, would change so it's not a huge impact for Conway. Conway would go from 85 to 68. Deerfield would go from 85 to 36. Sunderland would go from 96 to 72 and Waitley would go from 90 to 79. So 20 ish thousand dollars for three of the four elementary schools which is about how much of the transportation increase? It's probably about, it's close. And Half for most of, of those, it. it's good. So there's so many things that are happening. Given, given those numbers, uh, we love Deerfield, but not that much. It's all Phil, Phil, Phil. Only you would say that, Phil. <laughs> so I know there's a, there is some brain drain as well tonight. Yeah. We can, what we can do is. I'm going to recommend, and you can just decide how you can go off this recommendation or not, is ask Shelly to put that proposal together for Thursday. Thursday, you know, we have to have the meeting within 45 minutes because I have back to back meetings at night. Um, but we're going to, it's going to be an online meeting as well. Um, so, but we could propose like, this is A, the original, and this is A, have that short discussion. It also gives you some time to kind of think things over. Or you can ask, we can try to square this out tonight. I'm just kind of putting it out there because Shelly can get it lined up so you can see it visually about what it is rather than rattling up numbers. Or maybe people still have. I don't think I understand where the money would come from. We would use additional yeah. school choice funds. And what are we using this for now? <laughs> so our, our school choice balance, after all of the things that were already approved at the last meeting, which included paying down debt. The building management system and part of the fire panel and yes we do have expenses that we we need to maintain school choice money but my projection was that we would have about um, 1.2 million dollars in re reserves still available so you know 
Sam off a little bit on that. Maybe we're around a million. But also just for clarity's sake, I think we talked about this previously, that even though that sounds like a large number, there's a, a few uh, high needs people who could potentially yeah. make that number go down relatively quickly. There's so definitely be, always some risk that I don't an mean out that. of district lease yeah. could come up. But the positive side, it's a one year cost. We're going right. to paying that off and it won't have that cost next year. So we're not offsetting the budget with school choice, we're offsetting the, the capital or debt with school choice. So it's a one year cost and that's the best way to use school choice. So I think that maybe, not shutting down the conversation at all, but it might be a good idea to come with some fresh graphics. I just know that, that you have a chance to kind of review it and that kind yeah. of stuff and be able to show it. It also, and there's I no rush do, decision on that. I can do a refresher of what all of our excess funds are going to pay for, what that um, estimated balance is, what it would look like with the change, unless we're not interested in reducing at all and we move forward. We well, only one of the towns has said anything to us, and that's dear. Yeah, I, I hear that, but the towns have not seen, I mean, the, the school committees that are happening tomorrow, Thursday, and then Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week, all are going to see a 2% jump because of the transportation. So they are all going to be, like, Michelle and I are kind of, you know, dealing one meeting at a time, but it, it's like, how are they going to pay down we're going to need to have to reduce either any new initiatives or ask the towns for bailout or that kind of thing. So it is one district watching the other district, and we've kind of always less kept an eye on what's Frontier doing versus the elementary, but all the elementaries are going to get hit with, they got hit by the 80% increase in all four of the elementary schools. Both Deerfield got 105 because they have a flex bus to go to, they have an additional bus that goes up to uh, Eagle Brook because the full bus can't go up there to pick up. And I don't believe anyone, any, all of the elementary schools, I believe, are going to be over 5%. With very minimal new initiatives. There's not a lot of new requests. So really understand the ask, which is that you put together, I guess, suppose three as is, right? This is what we presented today, as is, or one that has us just moving things to debt exclusion or getting funds from somewhere else and paying off. That's the, the request that we have for you to bring forward on Thursday. Does that sound like what everybody's yeah, that's yeah. What that's what And there is a net benefit dollar wise to all four pounds, not just the deer, if we do this. If we reduce it 100,000, yes. Yeah. Of school choice funds, which we know aren't going to dry up because the school choice numbers are going down in the elementary school. So, can we can we get a straw vote of who's here about what we think about it? I mean, if we're going to take a hundred thousand dollars and pay for this panel versus assessing the towns the hundred thousand dollars, why don't we just make a decision? Why wait till Thursday night? Make a decision. It's a hundred thousand dollars. Can we take it out of it? So my, my, my immediate reaction is that with the paying off the debt is doing a tremendous favor for the towns. And now I hear basically one town saying, can you do us just a little bit more, which every other town would ask every other single year. I also heard we're coming up against a, a proposition to have override, coming from, I've had to do three of them over the last five or six years. Well, you know, if it, you might have to do it, but if it does benefit all four towns, then that's something I could support. But if it's just to, to avoid a proposition to an apple I mean, like, but but I, think, a I think that really that gets you out of the dilemma that you were talking about, right? Now this isn't a Prop 22.5 uh, skirt. This is, we took care of the issue, right. and it's kind of a win-win on both but, sides. But I did hear Shelly express a preference to to, to, to let, the, let the numbers marinate inside your computer for a couple of days. And but this is a so difficult like discussion yeah, 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 yeah. inside that box. But, but so, so, so we can look at each other and talk about this. This is the way to do this, yeah. not that way. Wait, right. Know, like this all. But the flip side of that is that if the business manager wants a couple of days to like, run this. Yeah, I get it, but is it, it, maybe I'm being overly simplistic about this, but 
what it does, basically what it amounts to is eleven thousand dollars for Waitley, twenty four thousand dollars for Sunderland, forty eight thousand for Deerfield, and a couple of nickels and dimes for Conway. Whatever sixteen eight, whatever percent, whatever your percent is. Sixteen forty eight, yeah, twenty three and eleven. That they won't have to, that they would not have to pay otherwise. That they could take wait, they could take the eleven thousand and help offset the uh, the uh, transportation costs. All of towns could do this if that's what they choose to do with the money. We can't tell them what to do with it. But is it that simple? Take hundred and divide it by the percentages, and that's what that's what we're saving. I want to see the saving from my town, his town, and his town, not just your her town. Not that I don't love the mother town, I really do, but. I want to see this go equitably for everybody, is what you were saying a minute ago, or because I was pretty jazzed with the plan, with the plan that you guys had, and then Julie comes in, comes in with something, okay, fine, the Air Force got difficulties, I get that, but so does kind of wake us after Tom washed away, and yeah, yada, 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 on and on and on we go. If there's a benefit that I can put my finger on, each one of the four towns, I'm okay, but. I, I also think that Deerfield's a little bit ahead of the game because one, they did come to the February meetings. So elementary and frontier, they saw the numbers. Their town meeting is early, so they're ahead of things compared to um, Wheatley and Conway. And um, the elementary schools haven't really seen the impact of the transportation. I sent Deerfield and I did send Waitley packets, but Conway and Sunderland haven't seen what those numbers look like yet. So people may not be in reaction mode as much as Julie is because she's already seen it. So I think it is new information, right? The, the transportation yeah. thing. And we Which, had, from where we were for the recommendation that we had a month ago. Right. And I think it benefits all towns to offset a portion of that if we can. It, it stretches us a little thinner and a little less comfortable than we wanted to be a month ago. But we have new information now. Both points, it's going to benefit everybody in that conversation. And so I, I think your request is an informal, how many of us might be in support of trying to help to offset that 100,000? Is that your? I'll make a motion that we, <laughs> I'll make a motion right here on the floor. I mean, we still have Davey and everybody here. Make a motion to take 100,000 out of either ED or, or school choice to take care of that capital capital project to help all four towns because we got a transportation coming up that's going to hurt. But before, all you, four. before you finish that motion, could, could we just hear from Shelly to, as to your sense of just our, our, cause the, the way that these things work, there's a lot of moving parts to these budgets. And um, you know, you, when, when the person most most responsible for the preparation of the budget says that they would like a couple more days I get concerned about rushing them for real and so um, could you just address so you, I do think it is as simple as Bill is saying <coughs> that it is you know you're deducting those amounts from each of the town and they will see the savings what I don't want to rush us on is making the decision without seeing what the impact is to the reserves and I would love to look at like the roof and we have projects that we've allocated funding for already what happens if they come in through the roof you know and and we need more money for the the fire panel I said 400,000 that's extreme I don't think it'll be that high but what if it's 250 and what if the roof is 450 and what if the BMS system is another 250 it, it's uncomfortable position. I'm not saying we can't do it. I just want us to be fully aware of what the numbers are. And based on Chris's question, maybe a refresher on some of the things that we've talked about over the last couple of meetings that would be helpful in the decision making process. What are you able to do in the next 40 hours towards that? Well, I mean, we have another meeting, so we'll make it happen. It's on the calendar. It is what it is. I think. I think in summary to different things, I, I, I agree with Bill, it's good to have this discussion tonight we're having, you know what I mean, because you're right, you get on the computer and it's just not as good as folks can remember. Um, and so we're having it, but I, I, I do, you're gonna vote it on Thursday either way. And so I think 
could, let's, let's ask any more questions we have on this. I think I would recommend going back to what Missy had said. Shelly provide us the three options that were coming into the next meeting. At that meeting, someone can move forward one of those options, and you, and you can kind of, if you want to straw vote it, as Bob asked um, earlier, to kind of where people are leaning. But at that point in time, you will have at least a summary where we don't come back later on and say, wait a minute, I didn't know that school trace was going to be under that much money, or these are the other constraints. Then we can kind of give a full summary of this is the risk we're taking, you know exactly where the numbers stand, and that we, you have all the information making that decision rather than doing that tonight and you're just going to rubber stamp it on Thursday instead of on Thursday, you make the decision on Thursday instead of rubber stamping on Thursday with the additional information. But be sure Shelly has all your questions tonight. I don't know how the rest of you guys feel, but you guys were able to make me feel very comfortable with that other plan. So if you could just do that again <laughs> before Thursday and make me feel real comfortable, I'd be a happy camper. So we got to make chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. <laughs> then you'll get virtually. <laughs> Do you want to proceed with a motion? I, I proceeded, but if we're going to wait until Shelley gives us the three things to talk about Thursday, Thursday, I mean, I'll rescind my my motion and just go with the flow and see what happens on Thursday. I mean, that's the best thing probably to do. And I just, you know, I just don't want to. We spent we spent a lot of time on this particular question. We get the three things on Thursday because we all have a lot of meetings on Thursdays. You just got to make sure that we have all the questions. And these are our options. Let's pick one and let's make a motion. Let's vote on it and continue on. But if we have more questions, we should probably ask them now. But I think I think if Shelley comes Thursday and says she feels comfortable with the the proposed like moving the hundred thousand dollars, and I think yeah, I'm ready to make it quick. But if she doesn't, I think it could be longer. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I think that it's hard to do it without seeing all the numbers laid out, and I think it sounds like it would make you feel better, and I think it would make me feel better personally. I don't know about everybody else to just see the numbers yeah, all laid out. I'm in support of it, but you might. We might find that we don't have as much and we'll just yeah. have to go back to square one. I mean, I kind of feel like it's like buying a car where you're like, it's fine, it's 199 a month. And you're like, but the price tag is, right? Like, I just want to see the actual numbers. And don't sell me on a monthly payment. But <laughs> give me an actual, give me the actual numbers. I'm in support of it, but. And the question of so the budget as presented, we move 100,000 in. And we keep with three options, what would be the third? The third would just be taking the capital would be zero and debt would be 140. The Julie, the Julie yes. asked. Yeah. Yes. Which does not change the assessment. So. But just as for that last part, I, um, if if there truly is a level of discomfort, I would just at, when we get to Thursday, I would hope that you would express that clearly and directly. Well, and, and, I want to remind you know, that it's your discomfort. I, 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 know, I, I know, I know, I know, but, but I'm not taking your discomfort. You guys are all. And I, know, I, 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 and I know it is the school committee's vote and responsibility, but um, you know, it, it's. I'm just asking for like when, in the to, to be clear about, um, as opposed to uh, I don't know, like the well, it might, it might, I might be uncomfortable. This might not, or whatever. Okay, whatever. But just yeah. I yeah. gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there, any, they're buried is, in there, cookies, right? is there any, uh, we can reduce the budget, once we vote, we can reduce the budget any time we feel like it. Correct. Is there any, there's nothing to prevent us from a month from now from reducing the budget by 100000 and returning it to the towns. When we've all got, you know, the gun is not pointed at you. Anyway. There's Which I support. <laughs> well, well, but I suppose that would be the argument so. for the debt exclusion piece. Right. Well, but, uh, uh, the, floor before, the number that was there, we just we there is a there is a there is a correction to that though. However, our anything that's going to be on the warrant, we have to let them know. Right. And so, in fact, it's already you know I get that I in contact with town of Deerfield. They closed their warrant. I said you got to leave it open until we have our meeting tonight because it's all mixed. It's all together. Um, so if you if you are going to assess them for the fire panel, 
you have to know that because they have to put on there. Yes, but there was nothing to prevent us from voting in September to pay for the fire bill out of school choice or E&D in this committee. There's nothing to prevent us from doing Correct. That. But then, but the towns wouldn't be able to use the difference on whatever their other problems yeah, are. I know. But if you That's did huge. switch it to all debt exclusion, and then we got more information on the roof bid, the fire panel bid, and all those things, we could reduce it if we felt more comfortable at that point. So. Yep. Okay. I realize it's our decision, but you guys have to provide us the comfort factor. Yep. If you can do that, I'm good. And, and we have we have reduced the budget on town meeting floors yep. at the elementary level. We took, I think, capital away. We took the capital off. Um, I always argue against doing that. It's it's always, it's, it's it's always that's, a, that's a nerve wracking thing. Right. And a bad habit to start. Can I ask yeah. a question? Have we ever tabled the rest of the agenda to the next meeting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, just I'm just asking. I asked Bill, he doesn't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is the first time I've ever had this happen. Yeah. 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 You, you can, I will let you do some, but there's some things you have to do. Okay. And I can go through them quickly. I'll make a motion that we go through it quickly. <laughs> I didn't say that right, did I? I'm glad my wife's we can, we can, we can move pretty quickly, I think, through this. Yeah. Uh, if there's any public comment at this point in time, like kudos Speak. to you for staying on this. There, there is none. I don't Chris think there's anybody here. here. All right. Chris and Mr. Roberts. Checking them off, like, quickly. Uh, George? So I send everybody my principal's report. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to let me know. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Bob. Right. I, the I policies. Don't know if I'm, an actual second I'm good on policies. <laughs> the policies, we've already, I've already read through them in the last time, so it really yeah. is a motion to accept the policies. You want um, me to read all the You've got to read them into record, though. Yes, you do. I make a motion to accept these policies KCD, KHA, LBC, EHAA, EHB, GBEE, JICJ, KDC, KDCB, EFC, EFD. I've been looking at it for a long time. BOTE. BOTE. Alright, somebody second. Second. All in favor? All in favor? And Damien's on there. You don't have that. Move to remove files of KCB. Second. All in favor? And you got Damien, I didn't see that too. Oh, and accept right. policies EEBA fuel efficient vehicles. Second. All in favor? Look at that. Right. Look at that. Already through with that. Calendar. Calendar. Note that the big decision of next year is um, I've done this calendar. I did run it by um, the associations of both. Or we have to get permission from them if we're going to start before the last Wednesday in August, and we do want to start um, um, prior to that. Uh, the main thing to look at between the two calendars that were given to you is that one has a two-week um, holiday break, Christmas break, it's sometimes called, um, and one has us coming back on the Thursday, coming back for Thursday, Friday. Is because the way the year falls, you, you return to schools on Thursday, in some districts. Western Mass, so the superintendents are kind of talking about it, are choosing to do a two-week break, and some are choosing to come back on that Thursday. So this is the first reading. We will be voting this as a joint meeting, and it's just enough spice to keep that meeting nice and long. Right, so if you have any questions on that, um, and it obviously changes the end date of the school year. About everything else is the same. Um, How many snow days are there? What's that? How many snow days are there? Um, I'm thinking about three. Okay. <laughs> one, of them was, uh, one of them was going to be the wrong call, just going to rain, yeah, and everything yeah, is going to be icy. Uh, I made this request last year. It's not necessarily associated with this one, but can you get an update of the last school day? Like, can we have that on the yes. website or something yep. like that? So it's like, just so you know, there have been there have been snow it. days. I try to add it. Now when I the last the school day is going to be this yeah, uh, as a. Remember, I get a lot of questions. Hey, when's the last one? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. It's not that. It's, it's what, which, when do we, you know, how do we avoid having to pay Juneteenth holiday? That's, that's. Phil. Yeah. Phil. Quiet. Yeah. 
sorry. Uh, uh, SLA plan. So the other one is the school committee calendar. Um, it's oh, just sorry, first reading. Got, just yeah. take a look through I it. Forgot. It's very similar to this year's, doubling up in the beginning and single things in the middle of the year um, with December off again. Um, just be ready for that discussion. SOA plan, I need you to vote this this evening. Um, basically, the state requires us to submit a plan about how we're going to use Student of Opportunity Act funds. As you see, we had to put this whole plan together for the $14,000 that they gave us. So um, we actually have a pretty comprehensive plan. There has been years, the last few years, I've not been as comprehensive with this. In summary, for Frontier, the, what the plan really is, for outcomes is the NICAP portfolio program for Frontier. Um, the Innovative Pathways, which you received a um, thing about tonight, um, is increased enrollment in that. Decreased absentee rates, and then new graduation requirement um, of a cultural studies requirement of two and a half credits. So those are um, the markers for the SOA for Frontier. You can read through the full thing, obviously. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it step by step, um, but it is a requirement for the state that you vote this. Move. Uh, not, hang on. Uh, can I ask some questions about that cultural studies? You're not, you're not voting that for graduation requirement in this. You're just approving the plan and the graduation project. That's great. Sorry. It's fine. Yeah. That's okay. All right. Great. Yeah. I'll make a motion to on the SOA plan yeah. for a vote. I'll make a motion to accept the SOA plan. Second. All in favor? Thank you. All right. Now you're. Now you're now you're up for the new graduation. You have the graduation requirement regarding the uh, the cultural uh, studies, the two and a half. So basically, we're asking we're asking to add it for a graduation requirement. Basically, uh, asking all students to be able to take a two and a half credit. It's in every other day class. Uh, it could either be in particular. It would either be like in gender studies or in, uh, in certain classes that fulfill the requirement. Um, yeah, I guess that was part of my question. Is, yeah. Uh, what culture studies? So there are certain classes within our ELA or ER, within our ELA uh, classes. So we've got like we've got gender studies, we've got women's studies, uh, we've got African American studies, things like that. So we've just so they're existing studies. Yeah, they're existing classes. Yeah, are. Okay. Yeah. I, would, yeah. I would actually table this one so that we can give you the full list. So I'm look at yeah, and that's fair. I, I got the I got the message like I thought you were doing that. So yeah. I think okay. let's let's table that once because we're changing graduation. Perfect. Because I have more questions. That's that's fair. Fair. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. yeah, I got a question about that. All right, so yeah. we'll put it on the next agenda. Excellent. And I think it's both to table it. Just to clarify, the next agenda is not. Not the Thursday, agenda. the next regular agenda. Just want to clarify. Yeah. Which is not until May. Yeah. Theoretically, I have to vote to table it and vote to pull it off the table. Okay. I'll vote to table this. Yeah. You do. You have to reach out to table something. I vote to table uh, the new graduation requirement. Second. All in favor, tablings? All right. Thank you. Uh, almost. Sorry. Uh, if you have not checked your email or not seen an email, um, I will give an update that Carrie sent out a link with the superintendent evaluation. There's a very nice synopsis, uh, both embedded in there, separate from the evaluation and to do the evaluation. If everybody can do that, time is ticking by the 50. Uh, that gives us a chance to get everything wrapped up and get a nice presentation for you. And, we're, and Carrie's looking for 100% participation. That's the plan. No we pressure, can. but we don't want to be the only school committee that's not at 100% participation. <laughs> I'm very competitive and I won't let you down. <laughs> All right, the collaborative Joe is not here to get that update. Do you have anything? Would you like to pull us into executive session? Um, the bus contract, we'll, we'll, I was talking about generally open session right now, but okay. the bus contract you know, did come in. It, you, I did send it to all of you, the, just a summary sheet so you can take a look at that. It doesn't affect, we talked about it already, it doesn't affect Frontier on that. I did put it on all the agendas because we, we haven't accepted the contract yet. Um, because we're accepting the bill, we have 60 days to do so. 60, 60. 60 days, so we will be voting it at the joint meeting. Um, the elementaries obviously are going to be wrestling with that a little bit more. And I guess if there's any general conversations, if we're going to do anything 
that talks about you know negotiation of a contract or not accepting the bid or doing that kind of thing. We should go to executive session because it's um, so forth. But um, if anybody has any general follow questions on that, I can answer that or you can shoot me an email, um, that kind of stuff. So what's the number? So Frontiers portion is going from 396, 396,000 to 460,000. However, the budget had a buffer already built in from the last contract. So there isn't a negative financial impact for Frontier. We're reducing the number of buses with the new contract, which has already happened, but we did not change the budget. Overall, district-wide, the increase was almost 48%, which is going to hit the elementary schools at 80% increase. And is so, but we've been paying a we've been paying a fuel surcharge. We have been paying a fuel surcharge, and we've been paying a cola. The fuel surcharge is not going to be in the new contract that was removed, and the cola will be fixed. It will no longer be based on inflation. So the two are sort of going to outweigh each other by getting rid of the. Previously, the current COLA is based on the CPI. So like this year, because there wasn't a huge change in the CPI, the COLA is minimal. Two years ago, the COLA was through the roof because it was like 3% or 4.5% difference. It's gonna be a fixed flat to 5% every year past the first year, but no fuel adjustment cost. This contract goes up to build that year. Were we in the mix for the countywide bidding? Did that open up to us last That's year? That's done. We didn't right. put in for it. Um, we submitted our own bid. But this it, bid is less than the history behind The history yeah. lesson behind this, for those of you who don't know what that bid would look like if somebody else, somebody else had bid it. There so. were, Gripco's still below market value. So while there's shocking increases for us. I would say it's about half. It's still the lowest, yeah. but this is adjusting that brings up closer to what our northern Franklin County partners are paying for. We tried this like 10 years ago with Franklin Tech, put in the hole, and it was like, you remember that? Yeah, the, the numbers we've been getting from Gribble have been better, and I haven't joined um, on that. And this is still better than what they're paying up there, but it is a market adjustment and a significant increase. That is, you know, timing wise, it's not. So we get 60 days to quit. It'll be on the April joint agenda. Each committee has to accept or reject the contract individually. Okay. All square? All right. Move to yeah. Second. All in favor? Okay. Second.